Um, thank you for the introduction, and um, thank you to is it Gies? I can't remember. I can't pronounce GT or whatever. Um, so you you did a very good job in kind of um, anticipating a couple of my slides. So um, I'm having heard about all your research over the last couple of days. I have absolutely no doubt that you will be publishing it in fantastic papers and getting great papers that are cited by many other scientists in the future. I've been so impressed hearing about what you've done and, and it's just been so interesting. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is actually just a bit of background about around what an impact factor is and what all the metrics are that we're currently evaluated on as scientists. Um, and also a little, as Guise pointed out, there is a lot of controversy about all of the metrics actually that are out there at the moment. So just a little bit of a thought about that. But nevertheless, it's kind of the way things are at the moment. So that's sort of how we're going to have to work with it. And um, I'll, have a, I'll just give you a brief overview of some of the most highly cited papers so you can get an idea as to what actually really drives citations. Um, and lastly, a case study. So it's just a paper that, um, a couple of papers actually that we published quite recently that were in a reasonably high impact journal but got a lot of um, good sort of citations and, and good reference outside the academic world, which is actually really, really important. And hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for questions. Okay, so I'm sure you're all very familiar with the old adage um, in academia, which is publish or perish. So as a scientist, people think that you're only as good as the number of publications that you have. And as Guise pointed out, um, you're expected to uh, reference your citations and your work on grant applications and so on. And it's absolutely true, we do have to publish our science, otherwise we will perish, basically. But um, there's more to publication than just simply getting it in a journal. It's important where you publish your uh, science, but it's also in, what's also important is the quality of the science that you publish wherever you publish it. So yes, we do have to publish, um, but we also have to think about the publications that we actually produce. So um, weirdly, I actually, I don't think I actually knew technically what an impact factor was. And so when I sat down to write this talk, I had a look and it's actually quite intriguing. I was, I was also wondering how I would fill half an hour, but I've just had to cut out about 15 slides because I got quite, uh, quite interested in this whole area. So the impact factor was invented by a guy called Eugene Garfield, who I'll show you in a second, looks um, strikingly like Einstein. He's quite a cool looking guy. And he first thought about it in 1955 when he was thinking about how we could get some kind of system for tracking citations of uh, publications. And in 1965, something called the Science Citation Index was produced. And that's when the impact factor really came on board. Um, it's basically issued by Thomson Reuters, who own the uh, SCI. And what it technically is, is the average number of citations received per paper published in that journal during the preceding two years. So an example is um, an impact factor for a journal for 2008 would basically be the average number of times all of the items were published, uh, were cited in that journal in 2006 and 2007. And with a new journal, they get an impact factor only after they've been in circulation for two years. So that's basically what it is. So it's an average number of citations of all of the items published in the preceding two years. Um, and this is him, this is Eugene Garfield, who came up with this uh, bright idea. I think he's a great looking guy. But um, I just want to point out, this is, so he's, he's actually been, he, he's actually written quite a few essays about the impact factor. And if, you, if, if any of you have any interest or any time outside your PhD, they're quite interesting to read. And he definitely doesn't think it's the be all and end all. Um, and this quote kind of sums it up. He says, in 1955, it did not occur to me that impact would one day become so controversial like nuclear war, sorry, like nuclear energy, the impact factor is a mixed blessing. In the wrong hands, it can be abused. And that is kind of what's happened a little bit. Um, and Thomson Reuters, who issue the metric, they acknowledge that themselves as well. So they say impact factors used are used to provide a gross approximation of the prestige of a journal, but there are many artifacts that can influence an impact factor. And it's really important to know what these are. So first of all, review articles are cited more frequently than any other original research articles. And so I'm sure many of you will have noticed that review journals often have very high impact factors, um, higher than uh, a lot of the journals that, republish, that publish original research. 
Um, it's also true that a journal can artificially inflate its impact factor by publishing um, an unusually high number of review articles over the following years, and that does happen if a journal's dropped the impact factor. Um, there's huge variation between disciplines in the impact, uh, the number of citations that it receives. And so it's kind of meaningless to compare your discipline with something that's very, very different. So if you are an obesity researcher and you're publishing mainly within the traditional obesity journals, such as Obesity, International of Obesity, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and so on, you should really be comparing journals within that field, not with a physics journal or something else. It doesn't make sense at all. Um, the item by item impact is important. So basically journals, the impact factor doesn't distinguish between the sorts of items that are used to create the average score. So the impact factor also reflects any letters that have been cited as well as reviews. And quite often there can be a controversial letter in response to a piece of research and that can artificially inflate an impact factor as well. Um, and lastly, journals can increase their impact factor by asking the authors when they submit a paper to cite their papers and from the last two years. And I'm, I say, yes, expect this, because it really does happen. It's happened to me quite a few times. Um, and I'm an editor on a journal, and I've seen that request being made before as well. Um, so anyway, that's just something to, to be aware of. OK, so what is a journal with a high impact factor? Well, I think you probably would all recognize these journals. These are pretty much the highest impact factor journals um, that we have at the moment. So we've got science. So basically what this means is that the average article published in science in the last few years was cited 34 times. Um, then we've got the Journal of the American Medical Association, Nature, The Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, which I'm sure all of us would all always like to get a paper into. And if you're lucky enough to work in cancer, you can publish in uh, CA, a cancer journal for clinicians, which has a whopping impact factor of 100, nearly 116. I'd never heard of anything like this, but my, my office mate, Abby, is a cancer scientist, and so they're always trying to get th things in there. They basically would send anything there pretty much as a joke, and then, you know, once every 10 years, it actually gets through the net. But anyway, so these are, you know, considered the highest impact factor journals in the field, but you absolutely do not have to be publishing in these journals to have a very good paper that's going to be cited. There are plenty of very, very good journals in our field. Um, and what I have done, and I'm very happy to share this with you, this isn't actually the full table because it didn't make sense to put it on the slide, but I have made a list of every single journal in all the different areas that I could ever publish my research in. And it kind of depends what I'm researching, but I have a list and I have all of the impact factors uh, next to it and I keep it on my pin board. And so every time I produce a paper, I would then think about what kind of research is this, what, what kind of journal should this be going to, who do I want to read this, um, and then I will check through this. And I'm not going to lie, I probably would send it to the journal with the highest impact factor that I think I could probably get it into. Okay, so there are other metrics with, uh, which G's mentioned as well. So um, in terms of metrics and how we're measured, there are two broad categories. There are the scholar metrics, so it's how you and I, as researchers, are evaluated. And then there are the art, what we call the article level metrics, so how an individual paper is evaluated. And in terms of scholar metrics, I'm sure everyone here has heard of an H index. So an H index is basically the number of papers that you have had cited the same number of times. So if I have a, an H index of 10, that means that I have 10 papers that have all been cited at least 10 times. And people get very obsessed with H indexes. And when I'm having a really bad day, I will trawl through all my colleagues' H indexes and feel suicidal. But it's, you know, it's just one metric. And also, it does depend on which area you work in. And it's, you know, it's good to keep an eye on it, but don't get too obsessed with it. The I-10 index um, is probably a better metric for early career researchers. It's a bit fairer. It's uh, the number of publications that you've had cited at least 10 times. And obviously, if you published a paper 20 years ago, and it's been cited 10 times, it's probably not as impressive as if you had a, published, a paper published last year, and it's been cited 10 times. But um, it's probably considered alongside an H index nowadays. Um, art of article level metrics, um, the, I mean, the main one is just the number of times that your paper has been cited in other scientific publications. And you can easily find this on Google Scholar. You can do the cited by, click on it if you 
put your paper in, it'll tell you. You can also set up a Google Scholar account, which I would advise that you do, um, which means that you can stalk all of your fellow scientists and see what they're up to and what their index is like when you're having a bad day. Um, but also you can keep a track of, um, of what's going on with your research. And then actually quite recently, it was only 2010, another metric came on board, which is called, which is kind of referred to as alt metrics, which is an article level metric. Um, and it's supposed to take account of um, citations of your research outside of the academic uh, world. And it was proposed as an alternative metric for impact. And it's not perfect either, but it, it, it basically will tell you how many news outlets, for example, have um, quoted your research, how many tweets there were about it. And you can even break it down geographically, so it's quite useful. And it is, I mean, of course it's not perfect, and it's trying to use, again, quantitative data to qualify something that's very difficult to actually measure. Um, but it's something concrete that you can put on fellowship applications for a paper. So, if you've published a paper as um, a PhD student and you're, or an early career postdoc and you're looking to write a fellowship application and it's relevant, you can say, even if it hasn't had time to be cited by lots of scientific publications, you could say, when I published this paper, um, it was actually referenced in seven different news outlets and received this many tweets all over the world. And that kind of looks um, quite impressive, I think. So this is the website for Altmetrics. And um, I don't think this, oh yeah, it's working now, is it? I have to hold the mic with my left hand. Um, so this is kind of, oh, sorry. Could you put my slides back again? Thank you. Um, so the, this is kind of what it is. And it, the colors represent different sorts of outlets that have cited your paper. But when you look into, uh, when you do a search of your paper and it comes up, then quite often universities have now linked this. So that will sit next to it and you can go in and have a look. Okay, so just a, a little discussion or thought about um, these metrics that we're measured on. This was a report published in the UK by the Higher Education Funding Council for England um, in July last year. And it was a, a, an evaluation of the role of metrics in um, evaluating researchers and their science. Um, and it was quite damning. So they said, too often, poorly diagnosed evaluation criteria are dominating minds, distorting behavior, and determining careers. At their worst, metrics can contribute to what Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, calls a, quote, new barbarity in our universities. Journal-level metrics, such as the journal impact factor, should not be used. So bear in mind that this is kind of the way that things are going. People have been so reliant on it for so many years. Um, and a guy called David Colquhoun, who is professor of pharmacology at University College London, who is a prolific writer um, on this topic and many other topics around science. And he's got a fantastic blog, if any of you want to go and have a look. Um, he, his comment on this was, it's absolutely astonishing that it should be still necessary to deplore the journal impact factor almost 20 years after it was totally discredited, yet it still mesmerizes many scientists. I guess that just shows how stupid scientists can be outside their own specialist fields. So. Um, unfortunately, it's still considered um, a metric that we are measured by, but bear in mind that the world is changing. And so actually what's important is doing really, really good science and doing good research. Okay, so this is quite interesting. I got quite obsessed with this. I was up till 2 a.m. Um, stalking through all of the 100 most cited papers. So last year was the 50th anniversary of um, the impact factor, which of course is an opportunity for nature to have a special issue on it and everyone's you know, getting all excited about it. And so nature asked um, Thomson Reuters to publish the 100 most highly cited papers of all time so we can have a look at it. And it's quite interesting to look at. So this guy, uh, Oliver Lowry, who I'd never heard of before, has the high, most highly cited paper of all time. It's received over 300,000 citations since it was published in 1951. And his comment is, although I really know it's not a great paper, I see if we get a kick out of the response. And um, this was, I think, a paper that described how you can ascertain the amount of protein in an assay. It's not my area, but apparently it's a very important technique. And this is um, looking through the top 100 papers. So, Nature, obviously loving uh, figures and data, broke it down and, and they've colored all of the different areas of science and you can sort of look to see which is dominating and, and by far, biological lab techniques are dominating the most highly cited papers. Um, 
So what do you need to be in the top 100? Um, you need more than 12,000 citations of your paper. Um, very interestingly, it, they, only two Nobel Prize winners were in there. The discovery of the structure of DNA wasn't there. Um, quite a few you know, groundbreaking findings didn't make it. And what became very clear was they were kind of dominated by methods, statistics, and computer software. So if you, um, and this guy pointed out, Professor Peter Moore, if citations are what you want, devising a method that makes it possible for people to do the experiments they want to do, or do it more easily, will get you a lot further than, say, discovering the secret of the universe. And it's kind of true. Um, so you're not necessarily, I mean, I think it's unlikely that anyone is ever going to make it into the top 100, let's be honest, in the, the number of scientists working in the world at the moment. But um, if you can publish a paper with a really fundamental method, then you're probably going to get a lot of citations. But I don't think we should focus on that. OK, so how do we get a paper published in a decent journal? Let's call it a decent journal. Um, and you can go onto the Nature Jobs blog. They have a lot of advice on there, and they hold workshops, and there are webinars and things like that. And this guy here, um, Kyle Vogan, he's a senior editor at Nature Genetics, so I kind of think that he's probably quite a decent person to give advice on how to get a paper published in a good journal. And no one can deny that if you, if you can get one publication in a decent let's call it home pack, decent journal, it really actually can set you off on a good career trajectory because um, people start to recognize who you are and um, would then be primed to read your future research. Um, but he points out that in order to do this, your research has to be of absolutely exceptional quality. And he actually said there are two components to this and he talks about the content and the style but um, I'm adding in communication here because I think that is as important as the paper itself and getting it published. So I'm just going to go through um, how you do this, basically. And it's just my view. Um, there's no actual science to getting a science paper published. Um, it's, it's not completely an art. There are things that you should be doing. Um, but it's still a little bit of a gamble. It depends on who reviews your paper and all that kind of thing. But in terms of the content, let's start with the content. Novelty is crucial. So your finding cannot have been published before. You can kind of get around this because it's also a bit of a selling sort of point. So you can, you have to really sell the novelty of your particular finding and why it's, it's new and relevant for that journal. And the other thing is conceptual advancement. So the, if you want to publish a paper in nature or science, they have to think that this is a total paradigm shift. You're going to change the way people think about this particular topic. Um, OK, you have to formulate an important research question. So you have to say why it's going to be clinically important. What are the ramifications of your research? Or you have to define new mechanisms, completely new mechanisms. You cannot just be confirming what's already been found or describing something. You've got to, you've got to explain why this is so novel and so new and how it's going to move the research forward, uh, field forward. Um, I've said a sound study design, and this is just so fundamental. I've said it's got to be as near, as perfect as possible. So the research question that you ask has to be directly linked to the methods that you've used. Because if the research design that you've used does not answer the question, if you're trying to answer a question about causality, but you're using cross-sectional data, forget it. Um, and data should be at the heart of absolutely everything you do. Your study can only be as good as the data that you've collected. And I know it's actually quite difficult often to get really, really high quality data and we're quite restricted. Um, but my advice to you is if you don't, if you feel that you don't have particularly high quality data that you can put forward for a publication, then try and access some. So there are two ways of doing this. One is to collaborate with groups who you know have really, really good data. And often, if you know about a study that's being run, you could do um, some analyses on there, which isn't core to that research team's um, questions, and they will give you the data to do that. And I'm really, really interested in anyone who wanted to do something on Gemini. Um, I'm always open to collaboration. So um, collaborate with groups that do. It's not always easy, and there's an etiquette around making contact with groups. It's often easier if you can get an introduction from someone um, or you know someone in the group. 
But there are also some really, really good freely available data sets that you can access as well. So in the UK, we have a huge number of very large scale epidemiological data sets. You, you're allowed to just go and do analyses on like, for example, the National uh, Diet Nutrition Survey, which we've accessed ourselves in our group. Um, and the two guiding principles that my mentor, Jane Wardle, told me, which I just think is so hilarious, and it's, you know, you can't really get something of this. She said, when you're doing your study and you're writing it up, the two guiding principles you have to think about are one, is it true? And two, so what? Actually, she said, who cares? Um, and she would always, you know, you, you could do your study and think it was so exciting and run in there with your analyses and tell her about it. And she'd say, and? And I'd think, oh my God. She'd say, so, so, you know, why is it so exciting? And if you can't sell that to your research team, you're not going to be able to convince a journal. So you have to really get your story straight, and, and it's really important to do that. Um, okay, Guy's also mentioned about the title, right? So this um, diagram here shows you the relative number of reads of the different parts of a paper. And this probably doesn't actually come as a huge surprise to you, that the vast majority of papers, only the title is read. Um, a few more, the abstract is read, and a very tiny proportion of the titles that are read people actually go on to read the paper. And so you must have a strong title to your paper. It's the most important determinant of how many people will read your paper. And you, it sounds like a simple task, but it's really not. And it's fine to ponder it and have um, a few different titles over the course of the paper drafting. Um, and I would recommend that you do that. And I have some... Um, I have some friends who work in the creative industry and they're, they're often quite helpful with coming up with titles for my paper. Um, so what is a title? Well, basically you're trying to condense the main findings of your paper into one sentence. So that's what you're trying to do. And you might have three different findings in there, but you need to summarize the key finding of your paper. You need to capture the reader's attention. So you need to highlight the novelty of your study. and your title should try and distinguish your paper from other papers, similar papers in the field. Um, and only ever have one key message in a title. And there are some do's and don'ts around a title. So um, one of the tips is to use action verbs, which make it lively and a bit exciting. Um, and keep it short. So less is definitely more, absolutely no more than 10 to 12 words. That's not very scientific. I should have said either no more than 10 or no more than 12. But anyway, keep it short. Um, don't use pointless generic phrases like on the study of, investigation into, investigation of. It's, it's really boring and it, it's unnecessary. Um, don't include unnecessary details. I mean, this is stuff I'm sure you already know anyway. Um, don't use abbreviations that aren't sort of, you know, generally understood. Don't have a question. You're supposed to be answering the question. So it should be a statement, not a question. Um, and lastly, like, so right, people do do this. So I'm saying don't use puns, metaphors, or plays on words. You can get away with that for a review article, but it's, it's not a great idea for an original research article, but people do do it. And um, there are an unbelievable number of titles that reference Bob Dylan lyrics in them. And I, I got quite into this. I was like, How? this is ridiculous. So, but this is, this is quite funny. So there were five scientists at the Karolinska Institute who, turns out, have had a running bet since 1997 as to who can get the most number of Bob Dylan lyrics into a title before they retire. And the person who wins gets a free lunch. <laughs> it's not, not a great prize, but anyway. So there was nitric oxide and inflammation. The answer is blowing in the wind. This is all the same group. Then um, the others came up and, and managed to publish Blood on the Tracks, A Simple Twist of Fate. Tangled up in blue, molecular cardiology in the post-molecular area, the biological role of nitrate and nitrate, the times they are a-changing, uh, and dietary nitrate, a slow train coming. <laughs> Lastly, F, don't know what that is, receptors, tangled up in two, independent control of cell positioning and proliferation. But the guy who agreed to be interviewed by the Guardian paper who discovered this actually did finish by saying, the bet is not for strict scientific papers. We could have actually gotten in a lot of trouble for that. This is for articles we've written about research by others, book in introductions, editorials, things like that. So things that are um, a little bit less 
um, controversial. Because if you come up with a title and people, it, it can undermine the seriousness of your science, um, even if it's fun. Although I have to say, this is my favorite paper title of all time. You probably think this paper's about you. Narcissists' perceptions of their personality and <laughs> reputation. I immediately was like, oh, read it. Anyway, so think about your title is a take home message, but you know, you can have a bit of fun, but it's got to have an element of seriousness about it. Um, okay, so the abstract. So the abstract is really important as well. And as Guise mentioned, I'm also an editor of a journal. And it's awful to say, but when you're very, very busy, that might be the only thing that you read before you decide whether to send it out for review or not. And if it, do you know what, a really bad abstract kind of puts me off. Even if I've got time and I go and read the paper, I've already been primed to be critical about the paper. So it's got to be absolutely solid as it can be. Um, it's also important because editors will sometimes write an editorial or a synopsis for a particular issue of a journal and they'll scan through if it, if the title's interesting, they'll go into the abstract. Um, and so that's what they'll look at to decide whether or not to write an editorial on your paper. And if they do, then your work gets increased exposure and that's good all round. And so what I've said about uh, an abstract, your abstract is basically a marketing tool. You're trying to sell your paper for someone who's intrigued by the title. Um, and you're trying to summarize the key points so that the reader will decide whether or not it's relevant and whether or not they want to read it. And I mean, basically, so abstracts are very prescriptive. The journal, unless it's a, a kind of socio sociology journal, most medical and science journals are very prescriptive in what you have to put in different sections. So I'm not going to go through all the different bits, but the key thing is you need to state the problem. You kind of need to overstate the problem and then have a grand statement about how your research has solved the problem, or at least part of it. And it's really important to then demonstrate the broad implication for your findings. So outside your field or on a larger scale. So then it comes to writing the paper. So what I've said is meet, discuss and formulate a strategy. So writing a paper isn't just about you doing your analysis and then sitting at your desk and then drafting it. Um, that's not how good papers are written. A good paper involves other people, especially when you're early career, and it involves discussion around the findings, around how robust they are, the angle that the paper is going to take, um, and then you formulate a strategy. And what I mean by that is you have to decide what type of paper you're going to write and who the readers are going to be. And so in my field, I generally have to decide if a paper is a science paper, so am I uncovering mechanisms, and I'm talking about that, or is it a medical paper? And they're fundamentally different papers. And sometimes I don't know, and it could be one or the other. And in that situation, I will go and I'll write two to three extended abstracts, one trying to write it as a science paper, another trying to write it as a med medical paper. And very quickly, one of them generally turns into a dog's dinner. And so I realize that's not the way to go. And so it's quite a good process to do to get you focused on, um, on the kind of the, the main direction and angle of the paper. Then you choose an appropriate journal um, and choose the journal before you write the paper. So few people do that. You must do that because you're going to waste your time. It's much better to have a journal in mind, to know the people who read those papers and what the editors are going to be looking for because it'll save you time later. Um, they also have all different sorts of stipulations around how you have to format it and that kind of thing. So I would definitely advise you to do that. Um, and, you know, things to bear in mind are, if you're, if you're going to write it for a medical journal, you need to think about doctors reading that paper. Um, what sort of statistics are you going to put in there? Doctors like things like odds ratios or relative risk. They like to see differences between healthy weight and, and, and overweight or obese. So having a load of multi-level models with beta values and things like that, um, that aren't really directly related to a doctor and what they want to know is um, probably going to be off-putting. And then tell your research as a compelling story. So you ask a big question, you answer it as fully as you can with your research. And what I said here is that good research builds up a whole picture of a system. So set the scene, provide the context, and then tell them which bit of that system you're, uh, you're focusing on. And this is really important. Keep it simple. It's really, really difficult for us scientists to do that. But um, imagine a GP, for example, reading your paper. So no more than three key messages. 
try and translate your statistics into very simple terms. And Jane Wardle always used to say to me, if you can't explain it to your grandmother or your mother in simple terms, who's not a scientist but reasonably bright, then you're, you, you're not doing a good enough job. So you need to be able to um, break it down and make it very, very accessible. And this is more important than ever now that we're moving to open access. So it's important that people outside of academia are able to read and access papers and at least try and make sense of some of it. Okay, scientific writing, right. It must be well written. I cannot emphasize that enough. There cannot even be a single typo in the paper. There can't be a full stop in the wrong place. Typos all over the place, half finished sentences. I would reject that paper. That just annoys me. It looks really sloppy. Um, but this is actually really challenging and it's challenging even for a native English speaker. And so if you're struggling with this as a non-native English speaker, then I would suggest that you invite native English speakers to be co-authors on the paper who can edit the language or you pay a scientific writer to do it because you can, you can get away with an awful lot if you have a beautifully written paper and it just makes the whole thing so much more enjoyable to read. And what I often do is if I'm thinking about um, submitting a, a particular paper to a journal, um, I'll read through some of the papers in that journal. The ones, for example, if, if, you know, if you want to go to the New England Journal of Medicine, they obviously publish a lot of different sorts of papers, but I'll look for some that are kind of similar to mine and how they've written it, how they've presented the paper, how they've argued it, and try and make it enjoyable and accessible. Okay, so I think you've probably all heard the saying, a picture speaks a thousand words. And nothing is truer than in science. Um, and I just wanted to introduce David McCandless here, who's a really cool guy. He's a data journalist and a designer based in London. And he has produced a couple of books, one of which is called Information is Beautiful. Um, and his whole kind of um, career is now built on trying to present data in really imaginative and um, beautiful ways. And data can be really beautiful, especially, you know, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen a Manhattan plot from a genome-wide association study, but it gets me every time. Um, and so this guy has produced this book. I've actually got a couple of his books because I love flicking through them and it gives me loads of ideas about how to present really complex data really simply and just a couple of examples. So um, this is his, I mean, this is a silly thing really, but this is, um, this is what breakups look like over the, the course of a year based on Facebook status updates. And you can see you've got a little bit of a peak around Valentine's Day, and the spring break, a um, bit lower on April Fool's Day, and then two weeks before Christmas, everyone freaks out and dumps their partner. So that was a by present maybe. Um, but that, I mean, that's just fun. And then he produced something like this, which you can't see very clearly here. It's much better in my book. But this basically, this is just over here. These are different uh, sectors in the job market with sort of sub areas within the job market. And he's trying to look at the gender pay gap. So he's got a different dot. He's got um, you could probably work out that the black dot is women and the green dot is men. And this is the salary scale across the top. So you can look to see where there's a bigger gap between women and men across different sectors. And you can see if it's bigger at the top end or the bottom end um, and compare within. So it's just a very cool way of aggregating loads of data. Actually, I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, this guy, Oliver Davis, who was at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London, then at Warwick and now at Bristol. And he's a statistical geneticist. Um, and he is absolutely brilliant at presenting data visually. And he got a Wellcome Trust Fellowship specifically to develop uh, visual tools to make very complex data accessible to not just other researchers, but to the general public. And this is just an example um, of something that he did. So what we know from behavior genetics is that um, heritability estimates can vary wildly, like from one city to another. Uh, they are influenced by age, they're influenced by social class. Um, and he was interested in finding out the extent to which the heritability of behavioral problems varies across the UK. So he used the twins early development study and calculated heritability by postcode basically. And then he produced um, a colored map showing that London is a hotspot for environmental influence on behavioural problems, whereas in the north uh, east of the UK, you've got uh, like a genetic hotspot where the environmental effects were lower. So this is just an example of one of his ways that he was aggregating a huge and very complex amount of data into just one picture. 
Um, explaining your data is also really, really important. So do try and translate your findings into concrete um, and easy to understand examples. So if you've done a regression analysis and you've got beta values, what do they mean? What, is, what does a one unit increase in that thing mean? And maybe you could give a concrete example or you could compare it to another risk factor in terms of effect size. But do try and, um, and spell it out. And again, just ensure that your statistics are kind of relevant for the audience. Um, and the sorts of things do that audience tend to like means, do they tend to like odds ratios, um, that kind of thing. Okay, your cover letter. So you've done your paper, you've written an amazing paper, you've had your strategy meeting, and it's now written for the New England Journal of Medicine. And so um, you need to write your cover letter. Do not overlook how important the cover letter is. It's not a small thing. It's not just, dear editor, please find attached my paper, please review it, thanks very much, Claire Llewellyn. No, 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 no. This is your opportunity to sell your paper to the journal. And editors do read the cover letter. And an editor can be swayed by the cover letter. So um, it's a really important opportunity. It's your one shot, probably. Um, do not address it to the wrong editor or the wrong journal. I've seen that. It's ridiculous. It happens all the time. And it particularly happens when you've submitted it somewhere and then you decide to resubmit it somewhere else and then you just attach the same cover letter. Don't do it. Change the date. These are really simple things. Just check it. It looks so bad. Um, okay, so what do you do in your cover letter? Address it to the editor-in-chief. Um, address it to him personally. So that indicates that you know the journal's editorial committee and that you bothered to have a look online, at least, who they are. Um, don't, don't have it as more than one side. Sometimes they ask you to include references and then list them. In that situation, you can list the references on page two, but keep the content of the letter on one page. Um, what you have to do with the cover letter is you have to convince that journal why they should publish your paper. And this includes telling them why the study fits in with the remit and the scope of that particular journal. So you need to know what the remit and scope of that journal is. And you can put a few keywords in because they always will uh, publish that. And you need to talk about uh, the journal's readership. So if it's doctors or psychologists or whatever, why they'd find that important and why it's something they would want to read. And also the novelty of your work because all journals want you to produce novel work. And what I do, as I mentioned before, is before I submit something somewhere, I'll tend to have a look through the journal. And uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute of the, the one I submitted, the New England Journal of Medicine. But I spent days flicking through the New England Journal of Medicine, looking for papers that were even remotely in my area so that I could make a story about why they should publish mine. Because um, being a behavioral scientist, sometimes people can be a bit sniffy about the science. And then the most important thing after you've got your paper submitted and published, this is as important as publishing your paper. You need to then publicize your paper. Um, and so I would suggest that you put together a publicity plan. So um, good papers will get just as many citations in lower impact journals as in high profile ones. If it's a good paper and you manage the publicity and the press release well, you will get attention. Um, so the journal reputation, i.e. The, you know, the impact factor, whether it's nature science, whatever, it's really just a vehicle um, to assist in you getting exposure for your science. It's not the, the end of the story. And just to say, there are a lot of high impact papers published in low impact journals, and there are a lot of low impact papers that end up in high impact journals. But um, publicity is really, 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 really important. OK, so just very briefly, I'm just going to finish with um, just showing you uh, what we did for these. It was actually two papers that we published at the same time in JAMA Pediatrics. So what we decided to do was we were writing these papers alongside one another. Um, one was in, one was showing that satiety sensitivity is mediating genetic risk of obesity using uh, measured obesity genes identified through genome-wide association studies. And the second paper was related, which was showing that infants who are infant twins who are discordant for satiety sensitivity in the first few weeks of life grow um, with discordant trajectories over uh, the first 50 months of life. So we basically came up with a bit of a story 
to um, develop and take forward our theory about the importance of satiety um, with these two papers. So what did we do? Well, first of all, we had several meetings and we debated whether they were science or medical papers. We wrote our abstracts, um, decided that they're probably going to be medical in their uh, angle. We first drafted it for the New England Journal of Medicine, and I spent ages going through New England Journal of Medicine papers, seeing how they wrote them, uh, what angle they took, so that I could then drop, name drop them into the cover letter and say, look, you've published these before. This is why you should publish mine. It's in the same area, but it's actually pro providing a completely new angle on it. And then um, we actually put some additional data into the papers to make it appealing to doctors. So we put additional medical statistics in there. Um, we then sent it to um, a guy called Mika Kivimaki and Atul Singhal, who are both professors at UCL, who've had um, a lot of papers published in places like The Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Nature, because I thought that they would be able to give me really good feedback on the paper, which they did. So following um, a discussion with them, and they were very, very kind in agreeing to review it for me, I then modified the paper quite a lot. I then submitted it to the New England Journal of Medicine, who reviewed it. I got two positive reviews and one damning one, and so they rejected it. But I incorporated all of the comments, and the paper was changed quite radically, actually, from the first time I submitted it. I then submitted it to JAMA. Um, they also reviewed it. Again, some positive, some negative reviews. Um, and they rejected it. Again, I incorporated their comments. And they advised me to resubmit to JAMA Pediatrics. Um, so at the time, it had just changed its name as well. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know about that. Maybe we should try another higher impact journal first. Um, but they were formally called the Archives of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine. And I was submitting this around 2013. They literally just changed their name. And I just had a hunch that when they changed their name to JAMA Pediatrics, that the impact factor would go up, and it did. Um, so that was kind of one of my, the reasons why I thought that would be a good move. Um, and then, as I said, we, we submitted two related papers to the same issue, just to kind of make a bit more noise, really, um, and then wrote a highly targeted cover letter. And I don't know if you'll be able to read this here, but this is just an example of the cover letter that we sent to the New England. So first of all, I made a pre-submission inquiry, so I contacted the editor and I said, listen, I've got this paper, what do you think? And he said, as they all do, oh, it sounds interesting, why don't you just submit it? So we did, so we said, following your suggestion, we're submitting it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I said, the New England Journal has published some key papers in this area in 2008, blah, 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 they published this. And then in the September 2012 issue, these guys showed this showing that potentially satiety mechanisms are being overwhelmed, something's going on, and our study provides new insights into the role of satiety, directly linking it to this. We believe our findings are important in advance in the understanding of the etiology of obesity, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we devise a publicity plan. So the first thing that you always need to do, as soon as you find out from the journal that it's been accepted for publication, find out the publication date. They won't often know, um, sometimes it depends on um, various other things like when they receive the money um, and it will go online before it is in um, hardback copy, but find out the publication date as soon as you can because the press office needs to know. Then you contact your university press office. You can also work with the press office of the journal and other organizations. And then you need to draft a really solid press release. And that is quite a big and tricky task. Um, and I would advise any of you to go on a course, and there are courses out there for early career researchers that will teach you how to do it. Um, then you work with your journal press team to raise the profile of it. If you have them, call your own contacts. So um, I've actually, over the years, I've built up a few contacts in um, the media of my own, and I will call them if I have a paper um, that's about to be published. And then once it goes online, and the press release goes out, usually under embargo for 24 hours. Um, the journalists often will want to speak to you if they're interested. So be available on your mobile for the day and the night, because they will call you all sorts of um, hours of the day. And if you're not there and they can't speak to you, either they might misreport the findings, which happens an awful lot, um, or they might not write about it in the end. And I've taken calls on you know, beaches on holiday before and that kind of thing. And if you really, really, really want to raise the profile of your 
findings, then you have to make every effort to get it out there. Um, so after that, we got we managed to get um, an editorial in JAMA Pediatrics. So the editor wrote a piece about the two papers. And then Nature Reviews Endocrinology wrote an article um, on these two papers and the whole theory after that. Um, and these are just some of the alt metrics. So we were in the top 5% of all research outputs, but the top 1% for quite a few um, for both of them in the end. So the, we got quite a lot of coverage outside of academia in uh, quite a lot of news outlets and tweets and things like that. So just lastly, um, there is guidance out there for this. Um, so Macmillan Science Communication, who um, are the Nature Publishers, offer masterclasses, webinars, workshops, that kind of thing. Um, I would advise that anyone goes to one of those. Nature blogs, Nature Jobs have a blog, which offers some quite good advice. There are articles about this kind of thing, but to be honest, I don't think that they're as useful as actually talking to really good mentors who've done this for years and years and are a dab handed it and colleagues as well um, and that's probably as much as advice as i can give on it and it's not perfect it's just the way that i've done it you will have your own way um, but for my pennies worth that's my advice so if anyone has any questions um happy to try and answer or anyone else in here who might be able to answer the question good luck <laughs> You're going to need it. <laughs> also, if you have Twitter accounts, tweet about it. I know people can feel quite embarrassed about doing that, and I, I'm really bad for that, because um, I kind of cringe at the idea of putting a status on my Facebook saying, I've published a new paper, and I've never done it for that reason, but it's ridiculous because, you know, we should be doing that, and we should be proud of our work. It's blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and certainly tweeting about it. And, you know, your university might have a blog. We've got at our, in our group, we have something called the Health Chatter. And so people will tweet about, about it and put the press release on there. So as much noise as you can make about it, do it. Talk to your friends and family when you go out. Tell them about it. That's how you get it outside of the, the ivory towers. I came up with a question. Uh, regarding the, the number of authors. Yes. Yeah, and this is, I think uh, an important issue because yes, now is. uh, I think editors want to have uh, for e for each author their contribution. Yeah. So you said that you can send your paper to uh, native language speakers. Yes, and but they the have others. to in they have yeah. to input intellectually to the paper as well because there are papers will publish their stipulation for authorship, um, and there are very clear. Guidelines. I mean, for example, it doesn't involve, if you've just collected the data, that doesn't qualify generally for authorship of a paper. There has to be substantial intellectual contribution to the paper. So that's either the research design, um, the, the kind of writing and the angle of it, not just the editing, but how you're actually, how you're drafting the manuscript, the angle you're going to take and advising on the interpretation of the findings and that kind of thing. But in terms of the number of authors, I mean, we've all seen the Nature Genetics papers have got 300 or, I mean, what a joke, you know, half of them have probably not even read through the, the paper before. But at UCL, they're getting quite strict about um, the number of authors. And so we were told no more than five. It starts to look a little bit like a, a job lot <laughs> if it's more than five. Um, and it dilutes the contribution of the authors who are not first or last. But especially for really? clinical trials or clinical yeah, yeah. studies. And sometimes it can't be helped. Yeah, which takes several years. Yes. So and and a lot of several, people yeah, are different involved. Different people in, yeah. the, in the laboratory, and different yeah. PhD students that yeah. collaborate. So the number increases yeah. very rapidly. Yeah. Um, the other th a piece of advice I would give to all of you actually is um, when you have your authorship, it's only fair that you're the first author if you've analysed the data and you've written the paper. And I know that can be quite difficult to negotiate with the supervisor sometimes, but that's something that you should try and, and aim for. Um, I know that often PhD students do an awful lot of work, write a paper and end up being the second author. Um, so I would always advise you to try and get your first authorship, which is rightly yours if you've done that. But also the corresponding author um, is considered to carry a lot of weight. So in the UK, as a researcher, if you're the first the last, which is a senior author, or the corresponding author, you can submit that paper as your own work that you were kind of leading on. And a lot of people don't realize early on the importance of the corresponding author. So don't just by default put your supervisor in there. If it was me, I would put myself down and I'd wait for them to change it.